respected senior colleagues and dear friends, a very warm welcome uh, to the monthly meet of APA Kochi for the month of uh, January. Unfortunately, we are again pushed back to the online platform due to vagaries of this ongoing pandemic. We all would allow to have a physical meet face to face each other and discuss interesting topics. So let's get into uh, today's session. The first is a case discussion from Astor Medicity Hospital and a very interesting caption borrowed from the Greek mythologist Killa and Caribdis. A panel, uh, a group of uh, experts from Astor will be discussed in this case and the session will be moderated by Dr. Gida Feller. And the second part of the session will be uh, a talk on erectile dysfunction by Dr. Bobby K. Matthew. Without wasting time, let's get on the first session or a case discussion. Uh, the master medicine. Uh, may I request Dr. Guida Philip, the lead consultant uh, at of, uh, internal medicine from Master Medicine Hospital. She is very well known to all of us. Dr. Guida uh, is a well known teacher and an erudite uh, clinician. Uh, she is instrumental in conducting the demonstrative program at Master Medicine. Ma'am, Dr. Guida, can you please take over? Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Radha Krishnan, and good evening to all of you. Uh, I am also a part and parcel of the API. So now I am on the API side and not on the Aston Medicity side. Okay. So <laughs> I am very, very pleased to welcome the team from Aston Medicity. They have come here to tell you a story. And that story is the Mozilla and Carbidus. Uh, it is a beautiful story. And they will tell you as we go along, they will tell you the significance of the story to the medical profession. So first, we have Dr. Tina Joy, who's a consultant in obstetrics and gynecology. She's multifaceted. She's a beautiful young person. And uh, she's very good at storytelling. And also, um, she's a singer. So you can see what, uh, what a talented person she is. Then after that, we have Dr. Mayuri. Dr. Mayuri is our uh, a surgeon in head, head and neck surgery. She's a consultant, and I have always appreciated Mayuri for her energy, very energetic, enthusiastic person. And what has always struck me is that she looks after her patients very well. She's always in the hospital looking after, so that is also an important facet of any individual. And then, of course, we have Dr. Shamima. I don't know whether she could uh, log in. And uh, we have been, she hasn't logged in. She has. Oh, Shamima is in charge of our infertility section. Very good speaker. And she will also be giving her expert comments. And uh, we'll have to give her another opportunity where she has to tell her story on a different occasion. And then we have Dr. Vipin here. All of you know Vipin. He's our endocrinologist. And above all, we have to welcome the anesthesia team. That is Dr. Jodi. I hope she has joined us, Dr. Jodi Lakshmi. She's a consultant. And uh, Dr. Suresh, who's not, I think he has not joined us. So before I tell the story, it is for Tina to tell the story. But I have to say one thing for all of us. We should remember that every petitioner is important to us. But we must also realize it is not an increase in numbers that it is urgent. We should take time to thoroughly investigate all who knock at our doors. If we do not do this, our reputation is at stake. So these people are going to tell us a beautiful story. And I hand it over to Tina. Tina, please. The most satisfying moment in an obstetrician's life is the look of pure joy on a laboring mother's face as her baby is handed over to her. But obstetrics throws many a curveball our way. This brings to mind the monsters Kyla and Charybdis from Greek mythology. Sailors in the olden days were terrified to cross the narrow waters of the Strait of Messina, which lies between the current modern day Italy and Sicily. The Greeks believed that the ships that passed that by would be devoured by the six-headed monster Skyla that lay in wait on one side. And if they tried avoiding Skyla, 
they would fall into Cherubdis, a whirlpool on the other side, which would suck in the ships and send all the sailors into their watery grave. Thus came the phrase, between the devil and the deep sea. So here, Dr. Mayuri will present some cases where we were literally between Skyla, the devil, and Cherubdis, the deep sea. So yeah. I think uh, we have a series of four cases. I'm going to present two. But I'll start, uh, I'll have Dr. Vipin give us a, uh, uh, give us a yeah. overview from endocrinology side and then I'll go into the case <laughs> details. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Gita ma'am, as well as APA for this wonderful opportunity uh, to present uh, the practical aspect of papillary carcinoma thyroid uh, who, uh, cases in pregnancy. So what are the difficulties that we had in uh, managing uh, these cases during pregnancy? So uh, ma'am will be definitely highlighting on all these aspects, but the practical aspect that we, were, we wanted to discuss were uh, first of all, how to diagnose these tumors during pregnancy, because we know that uh, during pregnancy, majority of the attention goes to the mother as well as baby. And many of the time, the neck is not being examined properly and no much attention is given to the uh, pa patient's neck or thyroid. Because we know that pregnancy itself is a uh, hyperestrogenic state where thyroid swellings as well as tumors can grow. So all these cases who, 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 uh, which ma'am is going to present were diagnosed clinically rather than uh, with any other aspect. So these patients were diagnosed clinically, then they underwent ultrasound, then followed by guided FNAC to diagnose the tumor. The next the difficulty we had was to tell the diagnosis uh, to the patient as well as family that you are having a thyroid malignancy and uh, tell them to keep quiet until the delivery is over for many of these patients. So a majority of them were uh, having apprehension whether this tumor will uh, cause anything uh, harmful to the baby as well as for the uh, mother. And uh, there are some patients actually we, who uh, we wanted to proceed with surgery during the second trimester as well. Then once we have decided we are not going to go ahead with the surgery, then the question was to go for the active surveillance, how to do the active surveillance during pregnancy. Uh, we know that the guidelines regarding the follow-up of unoperated cases of papillary carcinoma thyroid during pregnancy uh, is not clear-cut. So we had a follow-up of these patients with a monthly ultrasound initially. Then some of the patients had slight, incre slight increase in uh, nodule size or tumor size during pregnancy. Then again, we convinced the patient because of there is no extra thyroid, gross extra thyroid extension or uh, cervical lymph node metastasis, which uh, mandates surgery during the pregnancy. So then uh, uh, there were no tumor marker to follow up during pregnancy and some of the patients uh, developed some increase in the uh, thyroid nodule size, but we, were, we could convince them to postpone the surgery till the uh, delivery is over or at least uh, in the early postpartum period. So uh, in the postpartum period also many of the patients wanted to have breastfeeding for the baby, so they deferred surgery for some more time. So altogether, we had a tough time uh, in managing these patients during pregnancy. Anyway, with a multi-team uh, approach, uh, including all these uh, uh, people who are involved in the care of uh, papillary carcinoma thyroid, we could manage all these patients properly. I think at the end of uh, the Dr. Mayuri's presentation, we'll be having a clear-cut idea how to manage papillary carcinoma during thyro uh, thyroid during pregnancy as well as postpartum. Over to Dr. Mayuri. Thank you, Dr. Vipin, for that uh, insight. So uh, we have a very short, I have a short, uh, um, I mean, a short series of cases. We had three patients who were detected in the first trimester and one detected within weeks uh, postpartum. I won't go into details of all of them. Two cases uh, I will highlight. Uh, but before going on to the, uh, just to uh, recap, uh, recapitulate yeah. the basics. Yeah. So uh, I'll just quickly go over the thyroid cancers. Uh, this is all uh, right from uh, MBBS time. I'm sure it's just a revision for everybody. There are four types of thyroid cancer, papillary, follicular, medullary, and anaplastic. We are going to focus on papillary carcinomas here. Um, the, uh, this uh, slide uh, shows the current AJCC uh, staging of thyroid cancer uh, in the eighth edition of the AJCC uh, uh, cancer staging system. The uh, age has been considered 
in the staging system. So what has happened is uh, uh, when you're younger than 55, almost all cancers are stage one and stage two. And uh, the the stage four C has been done away with. Um, this is uh, this reflects better knowledge of uh, papillary thyroid carcinoma and how it behaves and how indolent it is. In general, it's the age. After the age, the next uh, adverse feature is usually the extrathyroid extension um, and, of course, uh, gross, uh, the histology. Uh, I'm sure all of us will recall from uh, MBBS surgery posting how we were drilled over the AGs, AMEs, DEMIs criteria uh, for uh, risk stratification of thyroid cancer. And actually, these still hold true. Um, uh, this is the only cancer where uh, post-treatment uh, also the risk stratification uh, can change. And uh, uh, based on how the disease behaves and post-surgery, post-treatment, also all of these criteria are uh, taken into consideration before deciding further uh, treatment and pro for prognostication. Nowadays, instead of these criteria, we have uh, we divide them into low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. Again, it is uh, based on uh, whether there is extra thyroid extension, what kind of histology the disease has, how much uh, nodal burden the patient has, and um, uh, whether we could remove it completely or not. Um, going to the next part, uh, see uh, over uh, back in. Uh, in the last decade or so, there has been a lot of uh, discussion and debate surrounding papillary thyroid carcinoma and for thyroid nodules in particular. Uh, in fact, there was this uh, uh, New York Times article uh, by Gina Colata, which said that, you know, there's so much overdiagnosis and that leads to overtreatment of uh, thyroid cancer. This followed uh, a pub uh, article published that really showed that there was a lot of ultrasound screening happening. And then a lot of these indolent or microcarcinomas, which don't have a, a very bad, uh, which have a, which don't have a, a bad prognosis or which sometimes can be kept on active surveillance were being picked up. And that led to uh, overdiagnosis of thyroid cancer. Just to put things in perspective, this was a paper published from uh, looking at uh, data from Kerala, uh, uh, or actually for population-based cancer registries from India, and uh, showed that uh, uh, there is a uh, there is a uh, increased incidence of thyroid cancer, particularly in Trivandrum district. Uh, and this does not, uh, similar trends are not seen in Delhi, Bombay, Bangalore. Um, uh, authors postulate that there is a possibility that, uh, you know, uh, the health, uh, these are, of course, uh, these uh, studies are, of course, from uh, cancer registries. So uh, it may, it may re reflect the higher socioeconomic status as well as the educational status in Rivandrum district. Also, the healthcare quality here may match that of a developed region. Um, next, again, there was a lot of, there has been a lot of debate about Korea's thyroid, thyroid cancer epidemic. Again, uh, uh, Korean surgeons are, are at the forefront of uh, robotic uh, surgery, robotic thyroid surgery in particular, and, uh, uh, you know, thousands of cases, most of them sub-centimetric uh, papillary thyroid cancers or small thyroid cancers. Uh, one of the reasons this happened was because of the way the healthcare system is and the insurance system is, uh, uh, again, very, very early detection of sub-centimetric tumors, which may or may not have a very important clinical significance. This was addressed in 2014 by a very landmark article or a landmark randomized tra uh, control trial from Kuma Hospital in Japan uh, by Professor Miyauchi and uh, his colleagues, where they uh, they randomized patients with uh, papillary microcarcinoma into observation or an active surveillance arm, where these patients were only being uh, um, followed up uh, with serial ultrasound and no interventions was done. And there were they had criteria. Uh, for ultrasound criteria based on which uh, once uh, the nodule is known to increase in size or shown to metastasize, then you intervene. And still the prognosis is good. It doesn't change the prognosis. Unlike other cancers where if you wait until it progresses, uh, treatment may not be possible. So this uh, really led to a land paradigm shift in uh, how we looked at papillary thyroid carcinomas and how we treated early uh, uh, sub-centimetric or microcarcinomas of the uh, thyroid, papillary thyroid carcinoma. 
um, following that, there have been a number of reports from different countries where, again, they've shown that uh, low risk early detection, uh, early detection, low risk papillary thyroid cancer might lead to an over treatment rather than a better survival. So, uh, what all of I've kept all these slides to uh, impress upon uh, everyone the indolent nature of papillary thyroid cancer. Um, and the fact that, uh, you know, it, uh, it is not as aggressive as the other, other malignancies. However, there is a subgroup within the my, microcarcinoma uh, uh, that uh, is shown to have, uh, even shown to have distant metastasis. Up to 20% uh, nodal metastasis rates have been uh, retrospectively reported. Only thing is, uh, we still need to study this and understand what, which are how, how to identify that something that doesn't justify um, over treating all the uh, patients with thyroid nodules. Now, coming to the basics of thyroid anatomy again, not to bore everyone, but uh, thyroid surgery itself is uh, not uh, you know the reason what is unique what makes thyroid surgery unique is the anatomy uh, and the physiology, but. In anatomy, what we face is the recurrent laryngeal nerves uh, and uh, the vessels that cross the various ligament as the nerve enters the, the larynx. Um, also, um, the vascularity of the uh, gland, the parathyroid glands, the tiny, uh, which are not, you know, uh, which can uh, lose their blood supply at the end of a thyroid surgery. Um, Everyone may be, may be familiar with the story of the famous uh, opera singer who got her goiter removed, uh, but then couldn't uh, reach high pitch, uh, high to high notes because her uh, superior laryngeal nerve was injured. And uh, after that, surgeons became more uh, cognizant of uh, the importance of the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. Um, back in the day. Uh, Samuel Gross had uh, called thyroid surgery a horrid butchery um, uh, way back. Um, we have come a long way uh, uh, in thyroid surgery, mainly because of the contributions of Dr. Coker, uh, who back in, again, uh, back in the early 1900s had brought down the initial mortality rate of thyroid cancer from 14% to 15% to almost less than 0.18%. And back in his days also, recurrent laryngeal nerve injury was less than 1%. So um, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for all his refinements. We still follow all the principles uh, laid down by him, um, and then uh, you know his he uh, later came Dr. Halstead who called uh, th thyroid surgery uh, the extirpation of the thyroid gland typifies better than any operation the supreme triumph of the surgeon's art. Um, I would like to think it is so. Modern day uh, thyroid surgery is not what we saw in Gross Clinic. Uh, we have a lot of adjuncts to make it even safer than what it was. We use magnifying loops. We use uh, uh, better illumination. Anesthesia is far safer uh, than what it used to be. If time permits, Lodima will talk about uh, uh, some of our cases. Uh, and what we do, what we also have today is nerve monitoring, uh, meaning uh, we have, uh, this, is, this is an endotracheal tube with uh, sensors on it. We, use, uh, we don't paralyze the patient and we use nerve monitoring during surgery. So uh, it uh, definitely adds another layer of safety to the recurrent nerves while you're operating. Um, I put this slide here just to talk uh, because just to talk about remote access or robotic thyroid uh, thyroidectomy because every time I talk, uh, people ask me about it. Uh, the only word uh, I have to say is that uh, remote access thyroid surgery, transaxillary, transbreast, transoral, which is where the world is going nowadays. These uh, techniques are still uh, being refined. They are not standard of care. Uh, they are they just all they do is they avoid a direct scar on the neck. Um, uh, and also, we have to remember that most of our patients present with tumors of this size. So um, right now, we are not there yet. We can discuss this in more detail if time permits. That's not the topic today. Coming to maternal and fetal complications from thyroid surgery during pregnancy. Uh, in the first trimester, it can lead to al altered organogenesis and spontaneous abortion. 
um, it can all lead to preterm labor and delivery in the third trimester. Coming to our first case, uh, the, this was actually my first uh, case, first time where I had to deal with this. And this was, as Dr. Pippin and Dr. Tina rightly said, it was actually hard, difficult not to do something. Uh, do it, going ahead with surgery, typically for a surgeon, it's easier to do things than not do with something. So this was a 25-year-old uh, lady who had, uh, uh, who had this, uh, you know, uh, who... This was her first pregnancy, that's the baby, and that's her thyroid nodule on ultrasound. You can see the microcalcifications. This is pathognomonic, so there was no question she needed an FNAC. Uh, the FNA was done in the second trimester, and based on the American Thyroid Association guidelines, which is what we follow, uh, uh, Looking at the uh, how dangerous that nodule looked like on ultrasound, she was recommended FNA. The FNA showed malignant cells, papillary thyroid carcinoma. It was a straightforward diagnosis. Um, and then we were in the second trimester at that point, where we gave her both the options of surgery in the second trimester versus surgery after delivery with serial ultrasounds. Um, Patient chose uh, serial ultrasound followed by elective thyroidectomy at delivery. Uh, we did we basically timed uh, her ultrasounds with the OBS ultrasounds, and uh, luckily her nodule was uh, stable throughout, and she un she uh, had a full term vacuum assisted delivery with a healthy baby at six weeks post postpartum. Uh, we went ahead with the elective total thyroidectomy. The pictures here are just to show uh, that, you know, post, you know, we're uh, in a lactating patient with a high BMI. Thyroid surgery is not, again, thyroid surgery is not easy. You can barely, this is after a four inch extension of her, four inch shoulder roll extending her neck. It's like, uh, you know, there's hardly any uh, lady with a very short neck. So this was not easy. Having nerve monitoring definitely helps uh, because it adds a layer of safety and we can discuss this if time permits. So this patient uh, had an uncomplicated surgery. She had transient postoperative hypocalcemia, which recovered and she was off. Uh, and uh, at two years follow-up, she, she has no clinical, structural or biochemical recurrence at, uh, at, as of now. Um, and that's her with her son, somewhere in Munar. Um, coming to case number three, uh, the, the next case, we had a lady who presented uh, with a, uh, uh, this is doctor, one of Dr. Shamima's case. She, have, she was pregnant with twins. Uh, and she was uh, uh, she was detected with an actually she was detected with a nodal mass in the neck. Um, it was a lateral nodal uh, metastasis, uh, which uh, she had at uh, she noted ten days before she presented to us, and at that point she was sixteen weeks pregnant. Um, so at, this is completely different from that other nodule. The first patient had a two centimeter, two and a half centimeter nodule, which was completely intrathyroid, so with no nodal metastasis. It was easier to uh, uh, counsel her for uh, follow-up uh, ultra serial ultrasounds, uh, whereas here the, there was no choice. One was that she had a large conglomerate nodal mass in the lateral compartment, averting the jugular vein. Uh, um, she also had uh, multiple other uh, uh, nodal metastasis, and this was the tumor. Uh, uh, the tumor was in the thyroid as well. So, uh, and on ultrasound, there was uh, a tumor abutting the posterior capsule of the thyroid. So, all of these are danger signs for me. I'm not going to sit on a tumor like this. So, we were to uh, operate on her in the second trimester with the twin babies. And um, again, uh, high BMI, short neck, uh, hardly any contours uh, felt in the neck. Um, and then, of course, our, our anesthesia team was constantly, uh, you know, listening to fetal uh, heart sounds while I was operating. This was the, one of the most nerve-wracking nerve nerve surgeries I've uh, performed. Um, this is just to show that you had a thyroid extension. Uh, if you see, these are little rings. This is the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve uh, entering the tray, and there was a lot of tumor here which had to be shaved off of the nerve. This is the left side. Actually, if you see here, the tracheal rings even lose their definition. 
so there was extra thyroid extension here uh, and disease has been shaved off of the laryngotracheal framework. So this was definitely a case not to wait until they've delivered. We had to operate, otherwise the, it would have been a disaster. Surgery was, uh, we had about 300 ml mils of blood loss. Surgery lasted almost 12 hours. Uh, patient needed IV calcium glucurate uh, for at least two days. Um, she had some neuropraxia also. Probably we, we never found out which side, but she needed nasogastric tube for two uh, for six days after surgery, and uh, with proper swallowing and speech therapy, she recovered. Uh, as luck would have it, she had some uh, obstetric complication while she was recovering, uh, meaning uh, she had a short cervix and uh, uh, there was cervical funneling, so she had to undergo a cervical encirclage. Uh, on day eight after the thyroidectomy. So then Dr. Shamima advised her to have bed rest since we had dissected both the spinal accessory nerves and she needed speech and swallowing uh, exercises. All of this had to be done while she was in bed. Um, but we managed. Uh, and then those are the twins now. Uh, she's on follow-up. She has been able to, after the twins were delivered, she has been able to take uh, high-dose iodine therapy. Uh, but she had to stop lactation to be able to give the, uh, take the iodine therapy. Dr. Shagush will talk about this quick, uh, when she, in a sh shortly. But as of now, she's on follow-up. It's too early to declare that sh uh, she's disease-free. Again, uh, just to sum, uh, just to summarize the ATI guidelines. So, if the papillary thyroid carcinoma is detected early in the pregnancy, it should be monitored with ultrasound. At 24 or 20, uh, 24 to 26 weeks, if there is a substantial increase in grow, uh, increase in the size of the tumor, or there are uh, metastatic nodes, then we should consider surgery. If it remains stable by mid gestation, defer the surgery until the uh, baby is delivered. For uh, other than papillary, meaning medullary or anaplastic thyroid carcinoma, the guideline is totally different because uh, these are aggressive. These don't have any adjuvant uh, treatment which works well. So these uh, cases, would uh, we would go ahead with uh, treatment regardless of uh, the stage of the pregnancy uh, and may have to consider even terminating if, if possible. A um, few quick uh, studies on uh, does pregnancy uh, impact, a few quick uh, uh, slides on, uh, you know, whether pregnancy imp impacts the prognosis of a newly detected thyroid carcinoma. So, so far there have been six retrospective studies uh, which have compared uh, these and uh, uh, there is no, uh, till now, no demonstrable difference in overall survival or disease free survival between the two groups. And the timing of the surg uh, surgery did not affect survival. So whenever possible, it's always better to uh, wait, let them deliver. But you need to follow them serially with ultrasound. Um, there have been two studies from Italy which have shown that there are higher persistence or recurrence rates in women who were diagnosed during pregnancy versus maliparous or those who were diagnosed late, much later post postpartum. Um, this needs a little bit further study because we are not able to explain what causes this. However, even in these studies, there was no difference. Uh, the timing of the surgery did not uh, affect the recurrence rates. So just to highlight that it is safe to follow. Um, then uh, what are the perioperative risks to mother and fetus of, uh, of thyroid surgery during pregnancy? Prior to 2008, there were no reported maternal. Majority of the patients were operated in the second trimester. These are all uh, published reports from uh, the West. And no maternal or fetal complications were reported in any of the studies. Uh, subsequently, there have been population-based studies in the United States, which have shown up, up to 5%. There have been, uh, there is a higher rate of uh, complications, endocrine as well as general complications, increased length of stay, increased uh, hospital costs, up to 5%, 5.5% fetal complications, 4.5% uh, maternal complications. Poor outcomes are also uh, associated associated with the experience of the surgeon or better outcomes associated with a better, more experienced surgeon. Um, another study from Japan uh, showing the safety of uh, delaying or deferred surgery until after delivery, especially for non-aggressive papillary thyroid carcinoma. 
to sum up uh, thyroid surgery during pregnancy when indicated should be performed in the second trimester in order to minimize complications to the mother and the fetus uh, preferably by an experienced thyroid surgeon uh, the risk of post thyroidectomy maternal hypo uh, hypothyroidism as well as hypoparathyroidism should be considered i would like uh, quickly before i uh, uh, go for questions if jyoti ma dr jyoti ma'am has joined i would like her to tell us about uh, uh, anesthesia in the second trimester especially lo long case like the one we did mayuri i i didn't get your question Ma'am, uh, anesthesia in the second trimester uh, yeah, yeah. for cancer uh, surgery. Anesthesia, anesthesia in second trimester is uh, a little more riskier because uh, the chances of a patient going in for an abortion or a preterm labor is uh, there are high chances. And thyroid being a, a surgery, it is a major surgery, and especially when it involves monitoring of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Uh, we'll be uh, using uh, uh, high doses of uh, dexam infusion, avoiding muscle relaxation. In such conditions, uh, chances of uh, placental um, uh, uh, the drug going into through the placenta to the baby, the chances are very high. So the risk is uh, both for the mother and the baby. But we'll have to uh, get a proper multidisciplinary meeting before. Uh, posting such a case and we'll ex explain that uh, how uh, risky it is for the mother as well as the baby. But we do our maximum um, to uh, support the mother as well as the baby. We keep a wedge uh, in the second trimester if possible uh, in, um, uh, to give a le left lateral displacement of the uterus so that the placental uh, perfusion is more and uh, explaining all the risk and benefit of the surgery, we go ahead with the, uh, for the surgery uh, using all advanced monitoring for the mother as well as the baby. Um, as Dr. Shagos logged in, either as panelist or new team. Thank you, Jyoti ma'am, for your comments. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, good evening. Myri, I'm here. Can you hear me? Ma'am, yes. Ma'am, if you'll talk about, uh, you know, the uh, nuclear medicine aspect of uh, papillary thyroid cancer management and right after the delivery, since these are all uh, ladies who are uh, postpartum. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, here, see whether to go ahead with radioactive iodine therapy or not is finally determined by the histopathology report. And based on the ATA guidelines, there are risk stratification, low risk, intermediate risk, high risk. Based on that, then we decide whether the patient should go for an iodine therapy or not. In these cases, usually these are indolent malignancies. There is no harm in waiting after the delivery because most of these patients uh, would like to go ahead because we don't want to deny the baby the benefit of breastfeeding. And so we don't want to go immediately, unless it's a very high risk case, we don't immediately want to go ahead with iodine therapy. So usually we allow the patient to breastfeed the baby till about one year or so if we can actually wait based on histopathology uh, findings. And then afterwards we schedule and radioactive iodine therapy is a treatment for this after the surgery. That's actually a radioactive liquid, which is given orally, which is taken up by the by whatever residual thyroid tissue. When I say residual thyroid tissue, these are microscopic tissues, which are not visible to the naked eye of the surgeon. So we do the scan first with radioactive iodine. After keeping them on iodine restricted diet for almost three to four weeks, we make them hypothyroid also by stopping the thyroxine. Then we give this liquid orally and when we do a scan 24 hours later, we can actually visualize whatever residual thyroid tissue that is there in the thyroid bed or in case if it has metastasized to other areas also, we can see in the whole body scan. And based on that, then we go ahead and treat the patient with the same medicine that we gave for the scanning at a higher dose when we give and admit them also. It becomes a therapy. 
why we admit them is because these are radioactive substances when we ingest the radiation comes out of the body so there are these are all uh, uh, based on the rules and regulations that is promulgated promulgated by atomic energy regulatory board we can't just give and send them off we can keep them in the hospital and then when the radiation comes down to a particular level we discharge them that is what we do and uh, as i said we usually wait till the end of the breastfeeding and also after the breast secretion is milk secretion is completely stopped because all this radioactive iodine is secreted in the breast milk so this is how we go about it um any other questions regarding iodine therapy i can uh, answer if somebody has any question thank you ma'am uh, for your comments i can see dr shamima is here uh, no, ma'am will you uh, put your concluding comments and then we'll uh, hand over to uh, physician uh, api team for questions thank you thank you dr mayuri and uh, thank you and good evening to everyone uh, no I, I i everything is well explained and all panelists have put in their comments very nicely so i just wanted to uh uh, uh i mean uh, uh, make one point clear that there is no shortcut to uh, clinical examination that is the only point i want to uh, uh, means uh, tell here especially to the uh, to our junior colleagues with lot of mm, uh other uh, radiological services and uh, everything is available by 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 chemistry the radiology everything is there but there is no shortcut to clinical examination especially in this covid time we try to miss out things because we try to avoid touching the patients especially in a patient like this who was covered uh who is a nakabi patient it was very easy to Uh, miss those uh, notes uh, even though it was detected a bit late i will say but still uh, we could uh, successfully treat her so especially to our juniors i want to pass this message thank you so much mayuri that very nice presentation thank you ma'am and i uh, 100% endorse that uh, even now with uh, covid we i often uh, i have to remind myself to examine the throat uh, neck exam is uh, the same and uh, must admit that uh, these uh, tumors were picked up uh, not by a head and neck surgeon <laughs> so awesome thank you thank you all um, uh, uh, api team geeta ma'am uh, uh, Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayuri and the team. And um, Dr. Shamima, though she's a gynecologist, she spoke like a fifth grader. She emphasized on clinical examination. So very proud about that. And that is something all the young generation should know that a clinical examination can never supersede any other investigation. First, your history, clinical examination, and they have so elegantly told us how to manage. Papilloma, uh, papillary carcinoma of the thyroid in pregnant women so dr radha krishna it's open for discussion uh, thank you ma'am it's a very good uh, case presentation and a beautiful discussion also for every aspect of the case uh, uh, i i was wondering how the surgery lasted so long 12 hours Uh, so uh, the patient had uh, a lot of extra thyroid extension, and this one uh, had a tumor surrounding nerves on both sides. Yeah. Typically, sir, we wouldn't dissect both nerves where there's tumor all around uh, at the same go because you know you may land up with a tracheostomy or a bilateral cord palsy, which is uh, which can be disastrous. Um, and uh, positioning like ma'am said uh, this lady was also extremely obese she had a twin pregnancy and, and i had to actually my usual positioning uh, anesthesia <laughs> anesthesia team didn't allow i usually prefer hyper extended neck where carotids everything is out here it was like a short uh, a short uh, neck uh, obese and uh, they had to get in under the drapes to listen to the uh, baby uh, fetal heart so you know it was uh, not uh, very easy this uh, this is also the nodal disease also both sides was uh, 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 infiltrating carotid sheath so uh, that was the reason uh, also i am a slow and meticulous surgeon <laughs> it's very quite impressive like i admire your patience and uh, what it all order the surgeons have 
to operate for such a long time. The physicians finish our job in 10, 15 minutes. So obviously we, we only make stories, but you do the work. Yeah, congratulations, <laughs> that's wonderful. And second Thank aspect you. is that you mentioned about uh, like you'll aggressively tackle the medullary carcinoma and anaplastic carcinomas. But how about the follicular CA? Are so, they uncommon? Good question. So, uh, follicular carcinoma, sir, uh, in general, they come under the category of differentiated thyroid cancers. So, in general, uh, compared to anaplastic and medullary, most follicular carcinomas also uh, behave well, have a very good prognosis. And if you look at the staging, it is similar to that of a papillary thyroid carcinoma. So, in general, unless proven distant metastasis are there, and follicular carcinoma still grows distant metastasis more because of the hematogenous spread than lymph nodal metastasis. Um, in a small nodule, it is very difficult to detect whether it's a follicular carcinoma or it's an adenoma. So if it's a small intrathyroidal nodule, which you're suspecting it could be follicular carcinoma, it can still wait like just like a papillary. But you'll have to be more vigilant uh, uh, with the ultrasound, maybe a little bit, uh, you know, more strict with, uh, if you're seeing an increase in size, have a lower threshold. But in general, sir, uh, intrathyroidal disease will uh, not progress so fast, not like an anaplastic or medieval. Thank you. Do you try to suppress uh, this carcinoma by giving extra dose of uh, thyroxine? So okay. that was a good question. Actually, I'm sorry, Dr. Vipin is not here, but uh, uh, we don't, because in pregnancy, uh, 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 we don't, because, uh, you know, the fetal, uh, uh, fe fetus may get suppressed. And uh, we don't want uh, any of that. And uh, so it's not recommended. None of our guidelines recommend it. Uh, it there's no, uh, it doesn't, even in uh, routine patients, for example, you had a patient who's not pregnant, but unfit for surgery due to some other reason. We don't suppress that. Suppression doesn't help. With the thyroid intact, suppression doesn't help. You need to get the thyroid out. You have to give the iodine therapy when it is indicated. And when iodine therapy is indicated, I'm sure Shagosman will agree you have to give suppressive PSN suppression uh, uh, and risks based on the risk stratification. But otherwise, sir, with the thyroid intact, uh, TSN suppression will cause more harm than me. Thank you, Mary. It's a very good explanation. Thank you. Maybe you can ask for some of the panelists or maybe some audience can ask some questions. <laughs> What are the uh, major complications uh, which we encounter in this, madam? Major complications we encounter in this type of uh, cases? You, sir, in the surgery, uh, like I said, recurrent laryngeal nerve injury is what we are worried about. Uh, in general, it's, uh, you know, if you have kept the nerve intact, uh, it's usually a neuropraxia, uh, which will recover. But neuropraxia of the recurrent nerve is not like neuropraxia of the hand or leg or it can lead to aspiration um, and you need to start swallowing therapy early. Uh, our, uh, he, we, we have a protocol where uh, regardless of disease, uh, we our speech pathologists see our patients preoperatively, teach them breath holding and a lot of exercises. They are followed postoperatively also and uh, most neuropraxias will recover. Uh, but uh, again, if you have a neuropraxia on one side and laryngeal edema, you can have airway issues uh, rarely. Um, second uh, is the hypoparathyroidism. That is ex more common than we think. Again, like, uh, you know, patients who are covered, less likely to have sun exposure, uh, 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 ladies uh, having uh, low uh, vitamin D. Uh, so in general, uh, the uh, post-operative hypo uh, hypoparathyroidism can cause a lot of problems. We are very strict with the calcium monitoring and uh, we don't wait for, uh, you know, uh, patient to become symptomatic before replacing the calcium uh, and then uh, usually they will recover but depends on how uh, you know how deficient the patient was to begin with and usually there's no time to correct the deficiency before the surgery so uh, hypoparathyroidism nerve injury and uh, also bleeding Thyroid surgery is still, uh, the bleeding is still, there's always a risk of bleeding. And uh, in thyroid surgery, an active bleed uh, is not, cannot be managed conservatively. You have to take the patient back. And when you take the patient back, the risk of the other, again, the nerve and the parathyroid injury again uh, increases. 
to the baby uh, and the mother as a nakiti so far we've not seen but again we are series is not large so i can uh, um is a radioactive uh, iodine is recommended in young age non question is there in the chat box chagos ma'am No. Yeah. Again, as I told you, all these are guided by the American Thyroid Association guidelines, and these guidelines are there for adults as well as pediatric. And radioactive iodine is not dependent upon the age; it depends upon the stage, whether there is lymph node or metastasis is all there or not. And usually, when this sort of papillary carcinoma happens in young children, they tend to be more aggressive, and in which cases we tend to treat them more aggressively. and for the treatment radioactive iodine apart from the surgery radioactive iodine is the main stay for differentiated thyroid carcinomas so if it is indicated as uh, by like you know spread to the lymph node metastasis there or is there distin metastasis is there definitely we would require treatment and we would treat them more aggressively and follow them up also more aggressively because there are as you know papillary ca thyroid is one thing which can recur even after 20 years it can recur so lifelong follow up is a must any more questions dr radha krishnan sheetal the audience so i think dr radha krishnan would you like to summarize that the take home message will be to choose the correct timing especially in pregnancy uh, the fetus and the mother both of them at risk so the timing and the how they manage both the cases is a exemplary manner yeah i, I must admit that all the experts have done a wonderful job in discussing this case and particularly dr mayer is like long surgery and very expertly handled in spite of the fact that papillary carcinoma is not infiltrated or adjacent adjoining tissues and the surgeon skill is really tested in thyroid surgery and as she has brought out all valid points and the importance of uh, adopting a conservative approach in pregnancy and she also has demonstrated by quoting a lot of articles from international journals peer reviewed journals uh, demonstrating that uh, wait and watch is uh, of course the first option papillary carcinoma in a pregnant lady but in but this particular case she had to intervene she was forced to intervene because of the extensive local spread of the disease local metastasis the disease so I, I suppose uh, team management is so important, and uh, for the good outcome of this case, positive outcome of this case, every one contributed equally. Of course, the surgeon has been the key performer, uh, all the same. But every everybody has contributed very heavily into this case. The diagnosis, management through all nuclear medicine aspects, and uh, I, I congratulate the entire team of Astro Medicine for handling this case so wonderfully well. It has been really a teaching experience for all of us. Thank you, ma'am. thank you for conducting this uh, session also very well so if there are no more questions i think it's time to go on to the next one yes sir sir so yeah just to thank all of you uh, especially sridhar and dr radha krishnan for giving our team this opportunity or let me we could not give them a dinner perhaps next time we can arrange yeah. that right. so thank you very much and good night to all of you thank you Thank you ma'am. Thank you madam.